Now, The Hunt Palmer Show. Yes! I feel like I've been waiting for this my entire life. You're listening to The Hunt Palmer Show on 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. Jolly good fun. Jolly, jolly good. Locking down the middle of the day. America's favorite daytime fun show. Live from the Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge studio. This is Hunt Palmer. Two. It's a two. Not a Tuesday. I, I get the day wrong twenty percent of the time. I do that, which is just pathetic. However, it is a Monday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Gulf Coast Office Products, right here on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Denton Day, thirty minutes from right now. A dramatic ending to the Commanders game yesterday on a spot that uh, the Commanders did not get the benefit of the call on. So Pittsburgh goes into Washington and wins. There were so many Pittsburgh Steelers fans. At that game yesterday, if you looked at the game, there were terrible towels waving everywhere. It was amazing. Um, but uh, Jaden and the boys could not quite get it done. We'll talk to Denton about that, as well as the rest of the college football scene that unfortunately does include LSU and Alabama. But in this segment, we always look at back at the Saturday that was in the Southeastern Conference and grade my picks against the spread. And I'll tell you, I was pl- pleasantly surprised when I sat down at my desk this morning and started looking at my picks. I just leave them right there. Every weekend, right there, and I come back and grade them. One, two, three, four, and one. Back on my picks yep. this weekend. I guess I just got to start keep taking underdogs. Because yeah, it's really I, the only way to live. Yeah, I've tried to tell you uh, every time, every every week you take all these favorites. I'm just, man, huh, that is a lot of points. You're, you're just giving away, <laughs> and you don't need to do that. Just take the points when we can get them. And that's what yeah. you did. I was correct on Texas laying 22 and a half because I did not think DJ Lagway would play. Yeah. He didn't. Uh, Florida had no chance. So that was a pretty easy cover. I had Ole Miss plus two and a half. I didn't love that pick. It uh, cashed with ease. I did have Vanderbilt catching five and a half. South Carolina laid waste to them. Uh, I had Mississippi State catching 24 and a half from Tennessee. That one snuck in as well, even though I did say that I thought Mississippi State would score 20 points. Didn't quite get to that number. Um, they didn't, did they? Was, Missouri? Yeah, uh, no, um, Mississippi State. Oh, uh, no, no. It, it was, uh, I think they lost by 18 or something like that. But I was saying they were going to score 20 points. Oh, uh, I don't know if they did. Let me see. I'm looking it up. But right. I uh, I thought they would I thought they would score 20 points, and that's why they would cover. Um, I think they just actually played a little bit better defense than they've been playing. Yeah, they, they had 14. Yeah, so they, didn't, they did not get the 20. Um, so I was still right, covered. Uh, and then Oklahoma and Missouri, like, come on, I, I don't, I'm not taking Oklahoma as a favorite on the road. Uh, Missouri did come back and, and win that game in the end. I think um, I'll ask you first, Beck. Uh, most uh, interesting result in the SEC on Saturday. I have a feeling I know where you're going, but I'll just toss it to you first. Uh, I mean, it's got to be LSU. I, I don't. No, I'm talking about outside of LSU. Outside of LSU, uh, I'd say the Ole Miss game. Um, J- 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 Carson Beck just continues. I don't know what's happened. It's like a monster stole his talent. Continue, I, I don't yeah. know what he was pretty good last year. I realize the supporting cast is awesome. Um, and that, that does prop you up as a quarterback at Georgia with all these four and five stars. But like they took Lad McConkey and Brock Bowers away and he, he can't throw it to the right team. He can't uh, yeah. complete passes. He, he just gets worse every week. It feels like, and um, I, I, here's my thing. And I said this at the time and I probably lost sight of it a little bit, but when I watched Ole Miss in Tiger Stadium, I was impressed. I thought they looked really good. I thought they they covered well and made things tough on Garrett Nussmeyer. Uh, I thought the pass rush looked to be pretty intimidating. I've always thought um, that Jackson Dart was a pretty good quarterback. I think Kiffin, Kiffin is really good. Um, I, I thought they looked really good. And they kind of, since that was their second loss, left the radar. And everybody's like, oh, well, whatever. And then they just kind of went out and just started beating the crap out of people. They crushed a good South Carolina team in Columbia. Just absolutely toyed with South Carolina for the entirety of that game and just dominated them on defense. Um, And nobody cared. And uh, they beat Oklahoma in a game they didn't play great in. But they crushed Arkansas and nobody cared. And I don't have a good explanation for why they lost the game to Kentucky. I'm not really sure how that happened. But... Saturday was not a fluke. When you stuff Georgia in a locker, like that matters. And this is the opposite of what we've seen from Ole Miss over the years in that 
they've done a good job of beating up on Arkansas and they'll take Kentucky out and yeah, they can handle South Carolina and they're fine. Generally speaking, they go and play Vanderbilt or A&M. But when they step up and have to play Saban in Alabama, when they step up and have to play Georgia, they get embarrassed. They're just not competitive. So what they did was they went out and they got a bunch of transfer portal guys at the line of scrimmage. Yeah, they got Trey Amos in the back end, and that's great. And yeah, they got Trey Harris from Louisiana Tech, and he's been phenomenal. But the difference is they're really good at the line of scrimmage. I had a conversation with um, somebody inside LSU's uh, building last week and said, we haven't really seen anybody quite like Walter Nolan all year. Like he just, he changes the way you have to call a game because you can't really trust that you're going to deal with him snap in and snap out. He's going to beat you a lot. And those are the kind of guys that Ole Miss just didn't really have. They've always had Laquan Treadwell. They've always had... Dexter McCluster, and they've always had they've had good quarterbacks that that are good college players. They've had the skill guys. They have not had the guys at the point of attack to line up and go get it. And now they've got Walter Nolan and JJ Pegues is a freak athlete. They got in from Auburn. It's the second year, but they got from Auburn. And they went and got Princely from Umami Ellen from Florida, and like they beefed themselves up at the point of attack, and they just flat out whipped Georgia on Saturday. And I'm not right now prepared to tell you that Ole Miss, like, they might be a championship contender. Like, I I don't, you do that to Georgia. I know this isn't Georgia from three years ago. It's not. But they're still good. And they scored 10 points. Carson Beck threw for 186 yards on 31 tries. No touchdowns and a pick. And this is the stat that really blows me away. Georgia ran the ball 33 times for 59 yards. 1.8 yards per carry. Like, that is some playing up front by Ole Miss. Yeah, I mean, when when has when have we really ever seen Georgia be dominated that physically, uh, especially at the line of scrimmage? Doesn't happen. No. Just doesn't. I got a fly that's just go driving me nuts. Over here. <laughs> um, but it. I mean, it's just. It was incredible to to watch Ole Miss uh, do that to Georgia. So they they're they're finding one. I thought it was you know like a little baseball uh, lean here. But um, for those that don't remember, Tim Elko was the MVP of their College World Series team, and w- his line was "Don't let the Rebs get hot." Um, you know that they started really poorly that year, and they they found a way to sneak in as the last team in as a favor to Bianco, basically. And end up winning the national championship. And um, Jackson Dart said after the game, what did Tim Elko say? Don't let the Rebs get hot? It, it kind of, I mean, it feels like that for Ole Miss right now if they can find a way into the playoff. And it feels like they're they're going to do that. So heck of an effort by Lane Kiffin and, uh, and Ole Miss. That's a, a program-changing win for them. And, and if they don't win that game and this season ends and all those guys leave, you've got to restock all the shelves again, which is an, a, a daunting task. Um, but I feel like you've got that fan base energized again. You've got the donors that are probably motivated to keep this thing rolling. Um, and that's just, that's a program changer uh, for Ole Miss to go and do that to the Georgia Bulldogs. So clearly the most um, uh, impactful game of the weekend. Um, I want to talk next about Oklahoma because I, w- I watched Sooner Scoop's post game show on Sunday, just out of curiosity, kind of see what the vibes were. They think this this could be it for Brent Venables. Like they think that they may pull the plug after the second year with him because it's just it's just so bad. And this was not an utter failure by the offense, and that's what it had been. And you fired your offensive coordinator, and Jackson Arnold's not any good, and Michael Hawkins is young, but the offense was was terrible, and that's why they're losing games earlier. Venables kind of has his guys on defense. You're two years into this, and you let Missouri, with a backup quarterback, take the win from you. I mean, the offense is turning the ball over, and Arnold's fumble was a crucial one. But Missouri scored 27 points after halftime. 27. And it's just hard to hard to, to look at that and think it's anything other than coaching malpractice. You should be able 
to slow down a Drew Pine Missouri offense and not allow them to score that many points after halftime. And then when you've got a chance to close the game out with a stop, not being able to get it done. And they just couldn't. And Oklahoma's just in a a world of hurt. And that's a game from LSU's perspective that you were looking at before the season started as one that would be potentially very, very difficult. And it may be. LSU's not really high and mighty these days after the last six quarters. But that looks like a very winnable game at this point. And it's even more disappointing, I think, if you're LSU, that you, you had this schedule that didn't include Texas and didn't include Georgia. And you got Ole Miss to come to you and you got Alabama to come to you and Oklahoma can't put two feet in front of each other. And you're sitting here with three losses already. But maybe things are worse in Norman, Oklahoma, because they're one and five in league play, five and five overall. They've still got a trip to uh, to Tiger Stadium coming at the end of the year. And oh, by the way, they're hosting Alabama in two weeks. So it's not looking great for Coach Venables and the Oklahoma Sooners at this point. It's possible after year two, he may be given the boot and they may look elsewhere there in Norman. So that's a look at, at some of the stuff that we saw in the Southeastern Conference. We'll come back and, and close the book on that. I've also got a thought on LSU's baseball scrimmage uh, yesterday at Louisiana Lafayette. So we'll do some of that when we get back on the Hunt Palmer Show. The Hunt Palmer Show. Genesis of Baton Rouge. Genesis of Baton Rouge.com. I know a lot of you don't love the experience generally of going into a car dealership and having that sales interaction. It's not your favorite thing. can be a little bit pushy. You don't have to Genesis Baton Rouge. One, it's not going to be if you show up, but you never have to set foot on the dealership to buy a Genesis Baton Rouge. So, well, I'd like to test drive it. Well, you can. You don't have to go to the dealership to test drive it. One of their brand ambassadors will come to you in the Baton Rouge area. If you're at work, you got 20 minutes to drive around, they can come to you. If you're at home, got 20 minutes to drive around, they come to you. They'll talk you through all the fantastic safety features and you'll see what driving a Genesis is all about. So sleek, so smooth, so comfortable, so stylish, so safe as well. Certainly a luxury brand of vehicles. And if you decide after that test drive, hey, I want to get in this Genesis of Baton Rouge, you don't have to go to the dealership to sign the papers. They can do digital delivery, e-contacts. Car can be delivered to you. Simple as that. It's a different type of experience at Genesis of Baton Rouge. Again, every single car that's on the lot is online at genesisofbatonrouge.com. Genesisofbatonrouge.com. This is the Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Gulf Coast Office Products. One hundred four five ESPN Baton Rouge is your new home for the New Orleans Pelicans tonight. The Pelicans host the Brooklyn Nets. Tip off is set for seven p.m. right here on one hundred four five. ESPN Baton Rouge, and congratulations to Rhett Meyer from Central. Rhett is the Week 11 winner in our 2024 College Football Pick'em Contest and wins a Hooters Wing Party for 10 people. Don't forget to make your picks for Round 12 by this Thursday at noon. Weekly winners will receive a Hooters Wing Party for 10 people, and the first place season-long champ will receive a 75-inch 4K flat-screen TV and soundbar plus free Hooters Wings for an entire year. It's the 2024 College Football Pick'em presented by Hooters. Ditton Day coming up in about 12 minutes. Talk about the uh, weekend that was in college football and a little bit about his Washington Commanders as they dropped a home game to Pittsburgh yesterday. Um, South Carolina is completely off the national radar, I think, but they're playing damn good football and really have been all year. You look at some of these scores. They beat Vanderbilt on Saturday by 21. They beat Texas A&M by 24. They went to Norman, Oklahoma and beat them by 26. They beat Kentucky by 20, uh, by 25. And two of their losses are LSU by three in a game that they very well could have won. Didn't, but could have. They missed a field goal to send it to overtime. And then at Alabama by two. Now Ole Miss punked them, 27-3 in Columbia. But that's pretty salty stuff for South Carolina. I mean, nobody's paying attention to them because they got three losses and they had three losses as of three weeks ago. So you're talking about mid-October, you've already got three losses. Nobody nationally is going to be talking very much about you. But that's just not a team you, you want to play right now. And Missouri will play them this weekend. Then they'll get Wofford and they'll be at Clemson and they'll have every opportunity to beat Clemson. This could be a 9-3 and three football team with wins that are pretty impressive to this point and losses that aren't that bad. 
Um, it's a pretty good win now for LSU. Doesn't really matter for much, but it's a pretty good win because um, I realized that Sellers went out, and you can always use that caveat. But um, LSU did come back from 17 points down and did score 36 points in that game to win it. So that's a, a pretty nice win for LSU. And South Carolina has been very, very good. Vanderbilt kind of turned into a pumpkin there a little bit. Uh, we'll see what happens. Then they got a bye week, and then they'll come to Baton Rouge. But um, that was some some impressive stuff there from Shane Beamer and South Carolina. And then not a lot to say about Texas and Florida. I, I didn't think that it would be all that competitive, especially with DJ Lagway being out of that game. And it wasn't. Texas found some rhythm offensively. They led that game at halftime uh, 35 to nothing. They just absolutely smothered Aiden Warner, who did not even complete 50% of his throws. He was 12 of 25 for 132 yards. He had two interceptions. Now the entirety of this story comes to LSU and in and, and Florida, who's the quarterback? Because if Aiden Warner plays on Saturday, LSU's going to be in really good shape. If TJ Lagway plays, it's going to be a dogfight, I think, because Florida did manage to run it okay on Texas. Jacoby Jackson had 116 yards on the ground. He was averaging six yards a carry, and none of that came on big plays. His longest run of the day was on, was 11 yards, and he still went over 100 on Texas. Uh, Jaden Ball had 19 carries as well for 88 yards and a touchdown. Like They ran it okay. They just had no semblance of any sort of passing threat. Um, and then Quinn Ewers kind of got it going a little bit. He threw five touchdowns and um, kind of got his mojo back. He had been kind of missing that since he went down, quite frankly. And so maybe they jump-started things a little bit there in Austin. So 49-17 to was the final in that one. That's kind of a look around the Southeastern Conference. I did, before we want to get to Denton, I want to change gears briefly and mention a couple things that happened in LSU's baseball scrimmages over uh, over the weekend in Lafayette. One, that's a savage move by Jay Johnson of uh, taking his team on the road to Lafayette the morning after LSU and Bama play a night game in Tiger Stadium. It really dampens the uh, amount of tailgating and fun his uh, his players can do. I think that's probably by design. But um, they were at, up to Lafayette bright and early. And I saw some some interesting things in the box score that I wanted to point out. I don't have a lot of of color to offer these because I didn't go to the game, but I do have a box score and I think it's, it's interesting to look at. Uh, William Schmidt had two really good innings to close out the uh, nine inning game that LSU won. He threw two innings, uh, had a walk and a strikeout, no hits, no runs allowed. Um, that's a positive there on the negative side. Uh, Jacob Myers did pitch for LSU in that game in the one inning he threw he walked three guys. That's the issue with Myers, and it's why I don't know that you can trust him uh, to be a, a big role pitcher on this team because now you've just got too large a sample size of two college years. Now it's time in the fall where walks are just not like a bit of a bugaboo, just a massive problem. You cannot uh, An SEC reliever cannot come in and issue three walks in an inning. That just that can't happen. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm right now – not counting on a ton of help from him. I'd love to be wrong because the stuff is great. and He throws really hard. He's got a great, great, great breaking ball, but you just can't can't walk that many guys. Um, one more from a pitching perspective that I think is, is very, very much worth mentioning is that Connor Ware, who is a left-handed uh, junior college transfer that LSU got in, I heard a good bit about him um, in the summer that they were excited about kind of what the potential was. He's been very good in his, uh, his three or four stints uh, on the mound in inner squads. They gave him the ball yesterday against Louisiana Lafayette. Two innings, five strikeouts. That's dealing from the left side against a, a quality opponent in Louisiana Lafayette. So I was thrilled to see that on the box score. Um, that was in the second game that LSU played and actually lost 6-3 to three to ULL. But where right now, I think, is trending towards a potential rotation spot. It's so early, and, and again, I don't mean to make any uh, real declarations at this point. But I think that where is trending in that direction right now, I think that's that's safe to say. Um, as far as offense goes, the big day was Jared Jones. He goes three for four in the one game he played in, and two of those three left the yard. He hit an opposite field home run for a solo shot early in the game and then got a change up with the bases loaded 3-0 and absolutely wailed on one over the left uh, center field wall. I saw that one on uh on Twitter. So Jones had a monster day, uh, three for four with five driven in and two runs scored on those two homers. Um, 
Mikey Ryan played some shortstop for LSU, as did Michael Braswell. Braswell also homered in the game. Jared Jones played a little third base for LSU, which I found interesting. Jake Brown kept his good fall uh, rolling with a couple of hits in the game that he played in as a designated hitter. Chris Stanfield had two hits in the game that he played in. Auburn transfer in center fielder. He had two hits, and one of those was a home run. He also walked, so um, that's a, a good sign there. Daniel Dickinson had two hits for LSU playing second base in that first game for the Tigers. So um, interesting stuff uh, from LSU and Louisiana Lafayette. If you'd like to look at the box score, you can find it on Louisiana's, uh, at, no, not on LouisianaSports.net. Uh, you can find it at LSUSports.net. We got a story up that LSU sent out, the press release LSU sent out on LouisianaSports.net. But um, good, good work for LSU. They've now completed their two uh, marathon days against other teams. They went to Biloxi last weekend and played Samford, and then this weekend they went over to Lafayette and played the Raging Cajuns. So uh, they'll just have the Purple and Gold World Series coming up in a couple of weeks, and that'll be a wrap on fall baseball. And we're getting closer. I saw a few of y'all uh, out. Um, where was I this week? I was at... Uh, oh, it was uh, last week when I was out at uh, M&L Distributors, and uh, saw some folks out there, and everybody was saying they're fired up they are for baseball. I, I'm right there with you, I promise. Uh, but we'll get there. <laughs> Gotta get to February first, so let's get football into the rearview mirror and keep working into basketball before we get too deep into the weeds with baseball. Um, let's come back and chat some football. Denton Day, college football overtime on Sirius XM joins us every single Monday. He will do that when we come back. The Hunt Palmer Show. Boudreaux's Electrical Services. They're a certified Generac generator dealer. They are a premier Generac generator dealer. That means they're in the top three percent nationwide in Generac sales. You're never going to hear me when I talk about Boudreaux's Electrical, talk about some club you need to join and pay more money so they can treat you right. That's not how they do business at Boudreaux's Electrical Services. Everybody is treated like a VIP from the first consultation where you decide what you're going to purchase to the installation and then the service after that installation of your Generac home standby generator. They monitor it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when something fails, whether it's caused by malfunction with the equipment or it just gets hit, knocked over, they'll know. They'll be monitoring it. They'll say, all right, let, me, let us come out and fix it so that when you need that generator to power on, to power your home in the event of a power outage, they got you covered at Boudreaux's Electrical Services. You can give them a call at 985-397-1562. That's 985-397-1562. Or near Gonzalez location, which is 225 area code, 393-89. I give you the easy way every day. It's BoudreauxElectrical.com. BoudreauxElectrical.com. You're listening to The Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Gulf Coast Office Products. Monday editions of the Hunt Palmer Show always brought to you by Gulf Coast Office Products, gcopnet.com, gcopnet.com. All your printing, scanning, copying needs, Gulf Coast Office Products. Shout out to our guy, Trey Beal. Always enjoy our conversations with Trey and appreciate him and the folks for being part of our Monday shows. Another part of our Monday shows, Denton Day, Sirius XM's college football overtime with us every single Monday. Denton, how we doing? Uh, I'm doing good, Hunt. I, I imagine you guys might be feeling just a little bit different this weekend, but I personally am doing I'm doing great. I made some money this weekend. Football's canceled. We are on to basketball and baseball. I hate the sport. <laughs> no, that's just how we felt on Saturday. It was a uh, tough one in a rainy Tiger Stadium. Let's talk, uh, speaking of disappointments, a little Sunday football before we get to the college football action. Uh, tough spot. For your commanders yesterday, right there at the end, Jaden completes a pass on fourth down. They ruled, did not reach the line to gain. I thought he was going to go down and uh, and get the game winner. Uh, didn't happen, though. What did you think about the spot that uh, that they gave you? I, I hated the spot. I was with you. <laughs> I was going to march down the field and, uh, and win the game. This was the first. I called it a bad loss, but bad has become relative because in previous years, bad losses are getting massacred on Monday night football or the, the bears who are winless getting up 20 to nothing in the first half of a Thursday night game. It wasn't bad. It was just a bad loss because you're now a good football team. And that was a game you definitely could have won and didn't won because of silly mistakes, drops, penalties, jumping offside, like all the little things, the fundamentals just weren't there. I thought he played okay. It wasn't his best game by far. I mean, his completion percentage was a, a smack dab at 50, 
which is not good. That wasn't all him again. Like there was a lot of drop passes, but he, he'll pick himself up. I, I trust him more than anyone. He's quite good, and I think there's a bright future ahead, just even this year, uh, for the Washington Commanders. We'll see if there's a bright future ahead for Alabama or LSU, but it was certainly all tied on Saturday night. What was your biggest takeaway from LSU and Alabama? I, w- I was stunned at how there was no answer for Jalen Milrow, and then on top of that, the offense for LSU was it was non-existent. I mean, you guys knew this, so I'm not giving you anything you didn't know, but this was a big game for, for Brian Kelly. It's your number three. I thought this was going to be a big win for them, and it just was the complete opposite. It looked like after the first couple of drives, they were they didn't really have a chance. So I was kind of disappointed with what I saw from LSU on both sides of the ball. Can you explain why Jalen Milrow was running free all night against LSU but can't find the same success against Vanderbilt or South Carolina or anybody else, basically? I could not. I was sitting there, and I was like, surely LSU that had two years of watching Jaden Daniels practice has to have an answer of what to do with a quarterback that can use his legs. I mean, they struggled against Marcel Reed, Lenore Sellers, and now Jalen Doro. I could not explain it. They just, they had their quarterback not need to throw the football and they nearly hung 50 on him. Like it was, I was stunned in watching that. It was one of Jalen Doro's best games really ever. And he didn't throw it hardly. Do you think they're a threat to win the national championship or not? No, I do not, because eventually someone's going to force him to throw, and that right now is where Jalen Melrose struggles the most. Uh, obviously, I think he throws a pretty decent deep ball, but in terms of like some of the underneath stuff, if you need you know a seven-yard out route with a man in your face, I don't know that he's there yet. But to be fair to him, I don't know that many guys in college football are there. It just kind of seems like a down year for quarterbacks. I don't think they're a threat. They might be able to win a game or two, but I don't know that you can expect him to do that four times. Is Ole Miss a threat to win the national championship? More of a threat just because I think their offense is a little more versatile. I was really surprised with the way that they not just beat Georgia, but the way they beat Georgia. Honestly, though, I think that says more about Georgia. I mean, Carson Beck has had some good performances, you know, the second half against Bama. Uh, I'd say the the whole game against Texas, outside of a couple of throws, he looked pretty decent. But I don't know what I saw this weekend from him. I mean, can you, isn't it funny, Hunt, that like, Three months ago, people were saying this guy's going to be a number one overall draft pick, and now look at him. Yeah. He was he was tough to watch. I mean, they're winning in spite of him, not because of him. It it was uh, it was wild uh, to watch Ole Miss physically beat Georgia the way they did, and then to watch Beck struggle continuously, just throwing the ball to the wrong team, and just been been completely inaccurate uh, as well. Wild scene in the Holy Roar. Uh, BYU edges Utah. Utah's AD grabs the mic and says they got cheated out of the game, basically, and he doesn't want to be in the Big 12 anymore. Uh, what you take from that whole thing? Uh, one, BYU getting the win, and then the the, uh, the postgame that ensued. You know, generally I would say I would have loved to be in the room on Monday between him and his bosses, but I have a feeling there was a Zoom call on Sunday to yeah. be like, hey, buddy, maybe don't get in, in front of the, the public and say we don't want to be in this conference that's paying us a lot more money because the only other option was a conference that is uh, right now dead. We know it's going to come back, but like, would you rather be in the Big 12 or the Pac-12? I think you'll take the Big 12 because, by the way, your season uh, doesn't exactly go uh, the way that you hoped it would. Um BYU just finds ways, man. Like, I, I think they're kind of similar to Miami in the fact that eventually this luck is going to run out. But until it does, you might as well just enjoy the roller coaster while we have it. They're not a great team, but they're a good team. They're fun. And you knew this one was going to be tough just because of the nature of it. Like, it's, it's a 10-15 kick uh, Eastern time. So, you know, the madness happens very much that traditional uh, Pac-12, or in this case, Big 12 after dark kind of a game. It was It was fun, if nothing else. I think BYU... When they get to the college football playoff or see Colorado in the Big 12 championship, that's when they'll get tested more than anything they'll see the rest of the year. Yeah, you mentioned Colorado. They fall behind 13 to nothing in Lubbock, and you're like, okay, this is the game they're going to lose because they're not very good. And then all of a sudden, they score 41 to Texas Tech's 14 in the last three quarters, and uh, they're 7-2 and two now, do you believe? I do believe. I believe that they're going to get to the Big 12 championship. And then once you get to your conference championship, you have a chance, right? And that's all you want to give yourself. And if you're going to give me a chance with Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter, I will take that chance. So I am believe, I'm a believer in Colorado. I just hope that those of us that are in positions of power in our industry handle it way better than we did uh, a year and three months ago. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that drove a lot of people nuts. I, um, I'm a little skeptical still 
uh, of that whole thing just because I think you're going to take a big step back when your son as the quarterback moves on and then the best player in the country moves on. But for right now, he's got those two guys, and they're playing They're playing really good football uh, at the moment. Let's talk about Miami. They lose to Georgia Tech in a real clunker. 28-23 was the final there. Felt like they were going to pull it out of the fire again. <laughs> they got the ball back. and like, oh, Miami's done this four times already. They'll do it again. But they finally uh, got tripped up. How big a deal was that? It was a huge deal, but it was kind of a classic Mario Cristobal game. He He gets maybe more so than any good coach in college football. He gets in his head more than anything. He was being overly aggressive, I thought, in the fourth quarter. I mean, that's fourth and 16. I understand the math. It's a two-score game, and you're trying to get one. But a fourth and 16, for the love of all that's holy, man, just take the points. Like, just kick the field goal, build some momentum. Your defense held them on a three and out literally the next drive. So I hate that. And then, Hunt, the death of me this entire season, I know the two-minute timeout is weird and foreign in college football, but you have to have somebody that tells you how to use it. Because these college coaches don't know how to do it. Cristobal wastes 20 seconds at the end of the game because he wants to keep all three of his timeouts for after the two-minute timeout. That's not the way you're supposed to do it. you got to call those timeouts before that two-minute timeout, squeeze as many plays as possible into as short of a time as possible. Instead, he wastes 20 seconds. Obviously, it didn't end up costing them the game because they made a bunch of other mistakes. But that's going to cost somebody in the college football playoff. Like, you have 50 dudes on your staff Hire some dorky nerd. If it's not, if there's no one in Miami that's a nerd, if you give me enough money, I'll go to Miami and I can be the nerd for the next couple of weeks just to make sure you know how to use your timeouts properly. Yeah, Crystal Ball is good in the uh, in the old living room. I'm just not sure he's great on the sideline. But you get enough good players, it, it can mask some things from time to time. All right, let's move forward to this uh, this coming weekend, Tennessee at Georgia. I feel like that game feels different today than it did on Friday after what we saw Ole Miss do to Georgia. How do you see that one in a top-10 showdown in Athens? I mean, this feels like another playoff game, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, it kind of feels like – I don't know that – I don't know that Tennessee would be fully eliminated with a loss, but I know Georgia definitely is eliminated from the college football playoff with a loss, unless everything else goes haywire in the SEC the final two weeks and a rivalry weekend just ends up being an absolute you-know-what kind of show. There's a lot of pressure on Georgia. I didn't think we'd get to a point this season where there'd be this kind of pressure on them, except for maybe in the second or third round of the playoffs. So we're going to look. I don't think uh, highly of Carson Beck, as I've made it pretty clear, we're going to find a lot about him against Tennessee this weekend. If they lose this one, ooh, I don't know what it's like in Athens when things go bad because they haven't gone bad for such a long time, but we're going to find out if they lose because it's not going to be pretty. No question about that. Um, do you think Oklahoma is going to move on from Brent Venables at some point? Um, yes and no. I, you know, Their biggest issue to me this year has been the quarterback, and I, and I guess part of being a head coach at Oklahoma is you got to find a quarterback, but I do love the way they played on defense this year. I think just because they haven't had a quarterback, it's been rough to sustain it for uh, an entire 60 minutes. You know, like they, They've been so good on defense. It's like if they had this kind of defense in one of those Lincoln Riley years, they'd probably win a national championship. So I think they give him a little more time, but certainly uh, just kind of with the way that things go in the SEC, if you're in there for a couple of years and you're not winning, someone else can, or they're at least going to try. But I mean, I think I, I wonder honestly, and I'd actually like your thoughts on this. Do you think programs are going to be a little more cautious just based on the way that things have gone at like Florida and Nebraska and then Tennessee for a little bit, because all these coaches uh, weren't doing it the way that they were supposed to, then they get fired and then you're in a decade of misery. So I think they might be a little hesitant in Oklahoma. I think everybody thinks they're going to be the next Georgia and they can get rid of, of Mark Richt and then, boom, Kirby Smart shows up. I, just, I think that's the way people think, even though we know Good that's luck. not the case. Yeah, that just doesn't you, – you can you can fire your, your way into mediocrity pretty quickly. So I just – it's it's weird because they're in that transition where they were beaten up on the Big 12 and they show up on the SEC and it's a disaster and there are a lot of factors there, but it's going to be – it's going to be interesting. Well, Oklahoma's last regular season game is against LSU, so that's uh, something we'll see up close and personal here in uh, in three weeks. Last one here uh, before we uh, get you out of here. Appreciate your time. Uh, who's going to win the Heisman? It should be Travis Hunter. It, it should be Travis Hunter. I think he's the best player in college football. It's so weird because the stats maybe aren't eye-popping, but there's not really a, a statistical way to quantify everything that he's done, and because there's not a great slew of quarterbacks across the nation – is it, going to be Travis Hunter. You know, I would have loved it if uh, Ashton Jenny out of Boise State 
would have been a real contender. And I think he'll be in New York, certainly. But if you're looking at like his numbers and the amount of games they have left, you're, a running back is only winning if you break Barry's record or come really stinking close. And unless he goes for like 600 yards this weekend, he's probably not going to be all that close. He's had good games the past few weeks, but much more human games to running back. So I think it's going to be Travis Hunter. Appreciate your time, Denton. We'll talk next week. Hunter, appreciate it as always, man. Thank you. He's Denton Day, Sirius XM College Football Overtime after the games go final on Saturday. You can find him uh, on Sirius XM Radio. Back, we've been talking on... Uh, on Tuesdays, and I'm not going to do any more because LSU's out of the mix, about how like nobody around the country is stubbing their toes in the way that the SEC teams are. And you figured it was going to happen. And as you look around the country on Saturday, if you were just locked in on LSU and Bama, well, you, you wouldn't have seen that it's starting to happen. Iowa State picked up their second loss. They lost to Kansas. Pittsburgh has now lost two in a row. They lost to SMU, and they lost to Virginia. So they've got that second loss. Clemson got beat by Louisville last week and barely eked by Virginia Tech. Like Teams are starting to pick themselves Miami up. Miami lost. Miami lost as well. That was another one that I wanted to get to. It, it is starting to happen. Um, you're just not in position to capitalize on it anymore yep. because you stubbed your toe against USC. It's uh, but you knew it was coming that all these teams weren't going to go eleven and one or twelve and zero, but it just it took a little longer than I think generally it does. And uh, and LSU, I mean, you start to look at the situation LSU would be in had they been able to beat Alabama, you'd be in a really good spot. And all of a sudden, you're just really not. <laughs> you weren't even competitive in the game on Saturday. So I just thought that was interesting. Um, something that we won't focus on because we're so hyper focused on. LSU couldn't tackle Jalen Milrow and what's wrong with the program and everything's ruined. But the things that we thought were going to happen have eventually started to happen, and LSU just found itself uh, in, a, in a bad spot there. So we'll come back and close things out here. It's a Monday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show. The Hunt Palmer Show. Audio, video, security solutions, AVSSLA.com. Christmas around the corner. If you're thinking, what, what can I do? What can, how about you get that home entertainment system put in? We, for a lot of people, a lot of different gifts. You can make your movie watching experience way better, game watching experience way better. Audio Video Security Solutions knows how to come in. They can provide the television. They can mount your TV. They can install the speakers, get the surround sound working. They can do things that are simple. They can do things that are really difficult or complicated like, hey, voice automation, fancy stuff. That's something you're interested in? Call Mitchell Fisher. Here's his cell phone, 225-439-7920. Again, that's 225-439-7920. Check them out at avssla.com or on Instagram, avss underscore br. All your audio, all your video, all your security, whether it's business or at home, it's audio, video, security solutions, avssla.com. This is the Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Gulf Coast Office Products. Shout out to the Gulf folks at Gulf Coast Office Products. All your printing, scanning, copying needs. They got you covered at Gulf Coast Office Products. I tell you every single week, they've got enough resources, manpower, to service your printing, scanning, copying needs wherever you may be in the state of Louisiana. But they're also not one of these big box stores. You're going to have a personal relationship with your rep. Their customer service is going to be fantastic. You give Trey a phone call, you're going to get an answer. You're not going to get some recorded message that may or may not get to somebody in Atlanta somewhere. Nope. Right here in Louisiana, in the capital city. It's Gulf Coast Office Products. Big enough to serve you. Small enough that you'll feel served. Gulf Coast Office Products. GCOPnet.com. All right. Let's play some take it or leave it, Beck. All right. First one here. Chance of rain. Never. Take it or leave it. Is it sacrilege to say leave it? I, that's like, no, I agree I with you. I don't love that tradition. I'm, it, yeah. I, I'm not like, it doesn't like make me, my blood boil like the uniforms, but like it rains in Tiger Stadium all the time. Yep, it does. I've seen rain delays in Tiger Stadium. I've seen the uh, Oregon State game was the worst rain I've ever seen. The uh, South Carolina game in 2007 was brutal. Um, and it was ugly uh, on Saturday night. I said this in my open, but that was two hours ago. I don't know if there are a lot of people that are still listening that were here two hours ago, but the, the fans deserve a massive tip of the cap for Saturday night. That place was full. That place was loud. The four times the Tigers gave them something to cheer about. Um, and that weather was terrible. <laughs> like I was sitting in the press box looking at the rain like swirling as it came down. And I was like, man, this, and, and after halftime, LSU was down 21-6, to six, looked looked bleak. 
and the weather was still terrible, and the fans were right in it. And so that was an awesome, awesome job by the, uh, the Tiger Stadium faithful in, in bad conditions. I, I don't need the chance of rain, never thing, but if it makes people happy, fire away. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't really care for it that much. I don't think it matters that much. I mean, I've I've, I've been in plenty of games in Tiger Stadium where it rains. So <laughs> to me, I don't really understand it. But if people want to say it, then I was uh, go, I go was ahead. telling Cassie I actually ruined a cell phone when I was in college one time because I didn't have a poncho and I just stood there in the uh, rain and my phone was in my pocket and it did not work after the game. So that's all right. R.I.P. to that phone. That was one of uh, about 900 phones I lost or ruined in college. It was a quite a run i once jumped in a pool with uh, the phone in my pocket of course and i stood there I, I was standing on the side of the pools in university view right down there i was standing by the by the pool probably drinking a keystone light mm. and like probably eight minutes after i'd been in the pool it started buzzing in my pocket i went oh that's not good <laughs> that thing was toast i also some one some, yeah you're supposed to put your phone in rice or whatever yep somebody told me to put it in the oven once oh and i didn't like get any like yeah. guidance on like what temperature or whatever and i put a phone in the oven and it like melted i'm i'm not gonna lie huh? you didn't seem like the smartest individual in college i, I wasn't then i'm not now I, yeah, just I guess is that's what fair. it is you I gotta, gotta work with what you got and it's not very much but here we are <laughs> All right, next one here. Omar Bradley the Tiger. Take it or leave it. <laughs> Omar Bradley. I'm going to leave it. As I said on Friday, like, yeah. I don't need a live Tiger. Uh, they, I mean, for those that weren't there, they, as the band was getting ready, um, they wheeled this truck out with the big cage, and it stood right there behind the it was LSU really more sideline. Like a glass box. Yeah, really. the band went and did its pregame and touchdown thing, and then they rolled the tiger out. It was out there for seven minutes. They did one little video about the tradition and bailed on it. I just, to me, this is just me talking. Like whatever, it didn't matter for the game or, or not. But like, the fact that there was like brain power put together to make that happen for six minutes is is a little much to me I just yeah it was a complete nothing burger so i just i don't know why we were doing it, but it doesn't whatever. all okay. right uh, next one here warner brothers is selling 10 fully functional but not street legal legal tumbler but batmobiles from christopher nolan's dark knight uh film trilogy each is priced at three million you got a couple million lying around uh go buy a tumbler take it or leave it so it's a car? That did, uh, you've can, seen The Dark Knight, correct? Yes, I have. You remember the Batmobile? The Batmobile, I got yes. that, but this okay. is a full-size it, vehicle. Yes. Does it go? It's functional. But you That's can't what, th- bring it on the street. Well, it's not street legal, no, but it's, so it's fully functional. So what do you do with Just, it? I guess you could drive it around, and, and maybe you're if you have a lot of land or something, I don't know. <laughs> Out in the field, you take yeah, the Batmobile private, through the cornfield. Your, your private residences. You, you know, I'm gonna, you I'm gonna leave this. One. No? I, I don't need a Batmobile. Um, does it have the weaponry that the Batmobile comes with? I think that's probably not gonna okay. happen. Yeah. Does it, does it have the deal where like the, turns, the wheels come out? Yeah. Like, and then it, maybe I don't know. I don't know if they have it where you can you can turn into the uh, the motorcycle yeah. as well. I'm oh not yeah, sure. the ejects and just yeah. use the motorcycle. Those huge, uh, huge two, tires. Two tires. Yeah. Oh, that's that's a great. Movie. It I is. don't need a Batmobile, though. I mean, look, Leave I, it. I've already told my friends, we got to pool our resources together. We can get one of these things. Just and, take uh, a loan out. That's true. Yes, take a loan. Just easy. Get, get yeah. one of those, like, 13% it, loans It's just a classic, something. yeah, a classic American dream, right? Take a loan yeah. out and just declare bankruptcy <laughs> get the, later. Get the Batmobile. Get the Batmobile. The American yeah. dream hunt. Last one so here. I saw something somewhere. Maybe it was, like, a Dave Ramsey thing that a lot of people are, like, taking out loans to go to Disney World. Oh. I, don't, I just don't know if that's the best decision. Probably but not. You want to go to see the Big Mouse far away. I just... I'm just not sure that borrowing money to do it's the best way. No, I, I would agree with you there. But uh, last one here, Tiger Stadium Drone Show. Take it or leave it. I missed it. I never saw I it. I didn't see it either. I saw a video of it, but I never saw when that happened. Um, I, I, you were able to do it because it was dark at kickoff, so I think it was pregame. And I, I don't, I, I'm a little late to the press box because for when they say the game's at 6.30, yeah. it's really at like 6.42. Or so Chris, almost. Yeah, six, so Chris wants me to go to like 6.15 on pregame outside the stadium. So then I have to go in, get in the elevator, go up. So I, I, I didn't, I probably didn't get to my seat until like 6:32, 6:34. I think it was supposed to be at halftime too. They maybe moved it up because of the weather. Uh, uh, I, I think, but I'm I not mean, sure. Yeah, about I'll, it. actually, I'll take it because the video looked cool. I'll take it. And but I never saw it, so I can't. Uh, I, I saw you, Omar the Tiger. Cassie, did you see it? Yeah, it was during halftime. Oh, and it was, okay. It was really cool. Well, okay, I saw like I saw it on the big screen, but okay. like I was in the student section, so because the scoreboard is so good, yes, I, like, and like so big, I couldn't like turn around and actually see it. Okay. But like they had like 
uh, they, they went in like shapes because the halftime show was like about like the Marines. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, for better. They had like the shapes of all like the. I saw that. First, and, and to your early point about how I'm a moron who bakes phones and jumps in the pool, <laughs> who's smart enough to coordinate 65 drones into flying artwork? I, yeah. Who are these people? They're smart, huh? I just sit in this chair and swat flies off my computer and talk about football teams that get beat by 30. I'm out on the drone creation stuff. <laughs> That's all I could do for today. I'll go type on a keyboard somewhere. I can figure that too. Matt's going to drive you home on After Further Review coming up next. We're back tomorrow, same time, same place. You've been listening to a Monday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show, as always, presented by the folks at Gulf Coast Office Products. The Hunt Palmer Show. Highland Insurance Group, highlandig.com. If I say EPL insurance, you know what I'm talking about? If I talk to you about DNO, you know what that is? Do you have any idea what your umbrella limit needs to be? What are your auto limits? These are all questions that you're not certain of and you're a business owner. Take the time to reach out to my friends at the Highland Insurance Group. They can walk you through your insurance program and make sure that you're covered because the time to start pouring through those policies is not after the incident happens, not after the flood. It's not after the car accident. It's not after the hurricane. It's right now to make sure things are properly done. And you can trust Jonathan Carbo and his team at the Highland Insurance Group to make sure that happens for you. They're not a magic bullet. They're not just going to cut 25% off your premiums, but they can make sure that you are covered when that time comes. Whether it's property and casualty, also group or employee benefits, the Highland Insurance Group is happy to help you out with that. They're here in Baton Rouge. They can service you statewide. It's the Highland Insurance Group. Check them out online, highlandig.com.